Natalie, you've just come through a period of a lot of changes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like I have. Would you like me to answer that no, question? No, well, well, let me just start it first. Yeah, I don't even think I got to the question yet. We thought it was just the uh, build up. Yes. We're just kind of moving up towards it. Um, no, but you have come through a period of a lot of changes. You've, uh, you know, you left your band, mm -hmm. you, know, you hired a new manager. You know, what, you know, was this, was there as much turmoil going on as it would seem? You know, what was, what was all that about? Turmoil? Uh, it really didn't feel like turmoil. It just felt like a, a time to change. I mean, I'd been doing the same thing for 12 years. It, probably like anyone who had the same job for 12 years and, and, and just wanted a career change. I felt like um, it'd be interesting to collaborate with some different musicians, but I didn't want to do it as a side project. I just wanted to make a break. So. Were you nervous about it? Um, the thing that I was most nervous about was um, finding the right musicians to play with because that was the most important thing to me. It's hard enough to find someone you can have a conversation with and, and feel a connection with, let alone someone that you can um, live with for long periods of time as you do when you're making a record and touring and still be able to create something with them. Making music with someone is, is really difficult if you don't feel um, a sympathetic relationship there. If the Maniacs had just come off, you know, a very significant and, and, you know, successful record, was there, did you feel much either external or external pressure to try to follow that up? Or had you, had you made that decision before even doing that? Well, the decision to leave the Maniacs was made two years before it was made public. So uh, I feel that even though we had two successful records in that time, the Unplugged record and Our Time in Eden, uh, Everyone knew they'd be out of their minds to suggest that I'd do anything different because my mind was really set on leaving and I think the success of the last two records was just, um, just made me feel better about the decision because I was leaving people with a bit of security. Sort of relieved any of the guilt that I'd felt about abandonment and, and things like that. I think it's universally proven that bands are very similar in structure to families. and. Um, it's strange. It's it's like an adopted family, and um, that the family was was um, successful in many ways. You know, things seemed to operate, and um, you know that was the thing that that actually I was frustrated with was that it just everything felt like business as usual. I just I wanted a little bit more of a challenge, but um, I uh, like the keyboard player Dennis and his wife had just had a baby and Steve's wife was expecting and, and I, uh, those were the things that I, I felt guilty about. If I should I stay so that they have economic security or do I, or do I stay until the kids are out of college? You know, what, uh, how, how long do I stay and, and if I'm frustrated should I be true to myself and, and move on? The, it's, it's really a, probably intangible if you've never been in a band. Your, your destiny seems very collective until you wake up one morning and say, no, 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 I'm an individual and I can, I can move freely about the world without five other people attached. Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you grew up? I came from working, working class stock and uh, my parents divorced when I was relatively young, so being the child of a singing, single working mother, there were always issues of um, financial security. There was, um, you know, growing up with, uh, with the, the threat of, of poverty was, um, was something that, you know, we always drove a used car and my mother supplemented her income by painting houses in the summer, which I didn't see many other kids that I went to school with. I didn't see their mothers up on ladders all summer, you know, painting houses to, to be able to buy our winter coats, which was what she was basically doing. We didn't have many luxury items. So um, even when I was in the band, up until about the sixth year, I really didn't think it was going to provide any security for me, and, and my family didn't either. I was constantly encouraged to, um, oh, well, this was a good thing to do, and you got to travel a bit, and it was fun. Now go back to school and, and you know, become something that uh, will provide you security. The, um in those early days, uh, you know, I mean, when I first actually met you and saw the band, 
you seem, you know, you were still a teenager and you seemed like somebody who was possessed when you were on stage. You know, there was a real kind of sense of uh, kind of artistic drive. What was, where, where did that come from? I, I think it came from the music and the, and, and performing, just knowing that I was in front of people who were, I don't know, maybe it didn't come from there either. I mean, that's the same feeling comes over me now when, I, when I'm on stage. It's like a raw sense of honestly understanding who I am at that moment through the music. The dancing is completely improvised. I don't, I don't have any routine of any sort. Like uh -huh. And then the singing, I think it's also because I was singing, when I sing my own music, that it's um, something that I invented and created and something that I'm giving to people and there's something really powerful in that. So what kind of criteria did you set for yourself in the music you wanted to make? Did you have a sound in your head? Did you know specifically what you wanted to do or you were, were you in a more kind of experimental mode? Well I'd say that the thing that I wanted to do is make a record very quickly because I didn't want to deliberate about it and let it become too heavy the weight of it being this is my first solo record and this is this is the defining record of my career I wanted to get away from the trap that that could create what I wanted to do was just put out a record of all the songs I wrote that I would felt best about in a, the year period after I left the band and um, as far as sound I wanted it to be very pure and, and very simple because the unplugged record taught me that you can just go on stage and perform live with a well-rehearsed group of people and a strong set of songs, and you could make a record. So all the months and months of um, laboring over a record weren't really necessary. I guess it depends on what kind of record you want to make, but that's the record I wanted to make. It's also a sense, I think, you know, or it seems in which you try to establish almost a kind of communal feel. You know, you bought a house during this period, right? Mm -hmm. and Weren't you recording in, in the same place, essentially, where you were living, you know, with, with the band around? Right. And the, um, the house that I bought, I bought with the intention of, of building a small rehearsal space, recording studio, and having enough room for a band to live with me. At that time, I didn't know who my band was, but that was sort of part of the selection process. It's, could I live with this person? And... Um, it was a good experiment. I'm glad I did it. Um, now that we're rehearsing for the tour and the group is larger, I've, I'm done with that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> right, they can go live somewhere else. <laughs> they All right. can go find somewhere else to live. <laughs> um, but it was a great thing to do because we had to become a band that felt like we'd been together for years and we only had weeks, months to do it. We actually, um, five months all together, that we worked together getting ready for the record. And then we worked in a residential studio too, Bearsville. Mm -hmm. You know, so we were in uh, Woodstock in the middle of the winter, and you can't get much closer than being in the studio 12 hours a day, and then, you know, <laughs> through the snow back to your communal dwelling. You know, we we were close together for this record. I can't hide behind uh, 10,000 Maniacs anymore. Mm -hmm. I am now. It's almost like I've become a brand name. You know, hand me the Natalie Merchant. What was your sense of anticipation about the record, you know, once you'd completed it and you are know, kind of waiting for it to come out? At that point, you know, did you feel more exposed than you had been in your career as, as, as part of a band? I mean, did you feel like you were out there in a way that, that made you more vulnerable? I think the thing that made me feel more exposed was that this record was um, lyrically more personal. Yeah, I mean, songs like, uh, you know, Seven Years or Jealousy are not the sort of things that, that people are used to hearing from you. There's, you know, the real kind of, um, maybe even in a dramatic way, a sense of a personal voice speaking, as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, the kind of more atmospheric lyrics that sometimes you would write. You know, were you kind of conscious of that as you were, as you were working, or, or certainly after the record came out? Right. Uh, more conscious of it when the record was out, and people started responding to it, but um, 
And I guess I, I just feel like I always have to remind people those songs aren't all about me, though I use first person as a device. Um, so I think because it's a solo record and because first person pronouns are spread, sprinkled throughout the record, I think a lot of people would think the record is completely about me. But um, I, I think it was also not working with a producer and being so involved in every step of the way, working with musicians who were really unseasoned. Jennifer, the guitar player, had really only played electric guitar for one year. She was 22 years old, never stepped foot in a recording studio before. So I had a lot of things to be a little bit apprehensive about. But And I recorded the whole record without the record company hearing anything but a demo of two songs that was made in January of the previous year. So when um, Sylvia Rohn, his chairwoman of the, the company, came to listen to the record, I think that was the most terrifying moment of the whole process. Was, you know, I'd paid for the whole record, and I wanted to deliver it complete to the company. Here's my vision. It's done. Ooh. <laughs> you know? Do you like it? <laughs> and she liked it quite a bit. So that I think with every step of the process, I became more confident. And What's your relationship to, you know, kind of commercial success at this point? I mean, how important is that for you? You know, you've established yourself mm -hmm. as, you know, an artist who's expected to sell a certain number of records. You know, is that, you know, something that, that comes into play either, you know, in your own expectations for an album that you would make or in your dealings with your record company? You mm -hmm. know, how does that play out? I'd be paralyzed if I was spending my time when I was sitting at the piano or at my typewriter, you know, writing lyrics. I'd be paralyzed if I was thinking about what will people think of this. So um, my theory is always if I please myself, then people will be pleased. And as far as the commercial success, the record seems to be selling um, as well if, or you know, even better than the 10,000 Minix records did. So I think any of the perf um, pressure that I might have perceived from the record company before has been completely, you know, eliminated. They're happy with the success. What about critically? You know, you've gotten some hard hits on this record. You know, you've always been somebody so who... I hear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you you I don't, don't pay read. attention? Well I, I I, well, I pay attention because people tell me what magazines to avoid when I go to the newsstand, but... Um, but I don't read them myself. Would it, would it really bother you to see something you know, negative? It would. I mean, I, I expect that some people, many people won't like what I do. I mean, there's a lot of music in stores today that I don't care for, but um, it's just always painful if it's something that, if you're an artist who, like myself, puts as much of herself into what she does. To have it heavily criticized is, is always painful. If it's constructive and I learn something from it, um, that's good. But I would uh, respect that criticism more from someone who was actually um, someone I was aware of what their achievements were. Someone who was, um, say, a producer or a fellow musician, or, or someone I knew who had been writing about music for years and years and years, and I really respected their opinion. Another band that came up as you know roughly your contemporary and that you know you've had a lot of involvement with is you know REM. Obviously, your personal friends with Michael Stipe, you've toured with REM. Mm -hmm. You know, and and there was certainly a sense early in 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 the career of Ten Thousand Maniacs that REM almost kind of like loomed as a, a model mm -hmm. or or you know Big kind of brother. direction setter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, they seem to have kind of veered off in a direction very different from yours. I mean, at the same time as you're talking about your music being soothing, they seem to have really gotten more abrasive lately. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering how, how you see that, that kind of ebb and flow. Um, well, I think it's good for an artist to metamorphosize, and I think that's what they've been able to do with every record. Um, I went to, I've seen them three or four times on this tour, and it's exciting, but I don't know if I'm being nostalgic or if, um, you know, just for personal reasons or, or, or what, but when they do a song like South Central Rain or um, Fall on Me, I get a feeling that I don't get with a lot of the newer material. So um, I always felt like pop bands with a spiritual side to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to start sounding sounding a way that I don't want to sound, but um, 
I, I'm drawn to that, and REM had that. They have it still, but um, uh, that's the thing that it attracted me to them. I think the, the record Murmur, I probably listened to that 40 times the first two weeks that I had it. You know, it was just there was something about it that just touched me. You know, the, when you talk about something like pop music with a spiritual side, you know, it, it seems like for a long time in your career, you know, I think it would seem like you felt really uncomfortable almost with, with the role of, you know, being the front person in a band and, you know, the, some of your con concerns maybe extended, you know, beyond what, what pop music seemed to represent, you know, it, at what point did you, did you kind of settle in and feel like maybe, maybe oh, you can do both? <laughs> yeah, right, what the hell? <laughs> Why not be a famous you know, right, singer in a great band? Um, <laughs> what point was that? Well, it certainly wasn't, um, when I was at, oh no, I won't mention that. It's just time, whenever I find myself at a music event, like a music business event, I feel like hiding in the, ba in the ladies' room, just hiding, you know, <laughs> and just, you know, I don't belong here, I don't know why I do this for a living, I, and I completely... Because it seems like a kind of convention of just business people, or...? Um, no, it's, it not, it's not so much the business people as a lot of my contemporary performers just feels like there's all these little subdivisions of musicians and um, I never feel like I fit into any of those subdivisions. I always feel like um, I should be over in the, the novelist category uh -huh. <laughs> or, or the, right, like, sure. the um, you know, gardener category or the, <laughs> you know, should have been a school teacher category. I don't know, I always, when I compare myself when I go to an event like the, the MTV Music Awards, I sit in my chair and say, where do I belong? Where do I fit? Where do I, I don't know. So um, those moments I still feel a little uncomfortable. But um, as far as, I, I think of myself as a singer and a songwriter. And um, I try not to, to get too involved in anything beyond that. I, don't, I, I find it really hard to um, create like an alter ego, Natalie, to travel around and um, go to events where I'm supposed to be Natalie <laughs> Merchant. Like the brain, like I feel like that's the one thing that's really awkward about for me being a solo artist now is I can't hide behind um, 10,000 Maniacs anymore. Mm -hmm. I am now, it's almost like I've become a brand name. You know, hand me the Natalie Merchant. Can, exactly. Can, exactly. can you get me the Natalie Merchant? Your Boy, Andy if Warhol I just had the Natalie Merchant right now, I could, you know. <laughs> it's like a, like, a three-quarter spanner or something. Get that Natalie Merchant wrench. You, know? <laughs> you have been we'll accused of being found. too serious. That's right, and, and politically correct. And too concerned. Do you have a sense about musical directions you know, that you might be interested in trying, uh, mm -hmm. ways in which you might be veering off? Well, I've always wanted to do a record that was more impressionistic. Um, I've been collecting my dreams for about 17 years, and I have a pretty amazing collection of images that I've always felt were just too abstract. I always felt as a songwriter that I was really concerned about um, delivering a message of some sort, and I, I would like to try to make a record that is more about the, the other life that we all have that we spend half of our time dwelling in that is free of logic and, you know, just free association. It sounds like, you know, kind of an aspect of, you know, kind of the opposite of, we'll say, one of the charges that's been leveled against you about politically <laughs> correct. <laughs> you know, right. Here are the charges leveled against you. <laughs> exactly. You hereby. And now we're about to make a decision on them, so you I hope that, you know, when the jury returns, <laughs> You have been we'll accused of being found. too serious. That's right, and, and politically correct. And <laughs> too concerned. With, with the world around you. <laughs> with the world around you. Live like you. a pop star. <laughs> Come on. Lighten up. <laughs> um, so what are you getting at, Mr. No, that, that seems like another side. I mean, the, the, the more impressionistic, poetic mm -hmm. kind of thing. I mean, because that's also something that, you know, earlier in your career, it, it seemed that there was a lot more of that, mm -hmm. you know, that... Uh, um, yeah, this kind of, you know, really fascinating, um, complicated poetry or something right. that, that, that 
um, you like to spin out in your songs? I've made six records with 10,000 minutes and now one by myself. And for anyone who knows all the records, they can see that there, there was a beginning when I was more abstract. And then I drifted into more of like a, a, a phase of being someone who addressed issues in my songs. And that lasted for about three records. And then I drifted, I've been drif drifting progressively away from that. And there was a moment when I really felt it happen for me was um, during the Gulf War. I just felt that anything that I had written was completely impotent. I just felt as, a, as an artist, maybe there was no way for me to write a three and a half minute pop song that was going to stop all the atrocity, or even a little bit of the atrocity that was around me. I just felt completely overwhelmed by it. It was the first, I mean, I'd been aware of covert wars that the United States had been involved in, but it was the first just full scale, you know, out in the open slaughter of innocent people on both sides that, um, that I was aware of. And um, I just, I just didn't feel like, um, I didn't feel like being, being that girl anymore. So what do you see ahead? Are you looking forward to being on the road? Or is, is that something as, is, I know at points you've had some difficulty with that. I mean, are you, are you looking right. forward to it now? I think all performers have a point of difficulty on the road, but um, I'm looking forward to it. We just played in Boulder, Colorado a couple nights ago, and first time in years I stayed up all night after the show at a party, at a series of parties, actually. <laughs> <laughs> An ongoing, a movable feast in Yeah, it was. Yeah. We had our designated driver, and we just kept, we met these kids in Boulder, and they just kept taking us from party to party to party. And I was just talking to people, and was having a great time, and ended up you know, watching the sunrise, and thought, um, this, this is going to be fun. I like this group of people. You know? I haven't done this in a long, long time.